Hello and welcome to another page of the Midgard Chronicle and what a page this is uh, as start of a new chapter really because Ragnarok is here first of all and second there isn't really a point for me to do anything else after this because uh, it is my honor and my privilege to be interviewing Eric Williams the director of God of War Ragnarok how are you Eric hi doing quite well like we're there it's like what hours away from launch now congratulations on the reception the seeing all the reviews and everything has been incredible to witness and uh i am not done with the game uh and it's such a it's such a blast it is it is extremely rewarding after all this time <laughs> and uh, uh covering it so closely to finally have it and it being such a joy to go through so that's just thank you so much to you and the oh, team i mean thank you so much for playing the kind words i mean uh, i mean the team took care of business that's all i can say it's it's they, they you're, really you're, you're right at the home sir <laughs> you you guided this massive project um before we get into this game i wanted to ask a little bit about uh the beginnings of this uh Norse saga really and about uh, the times in 2013 and 2014 when Corey this this guy uh was mm -hmm. pitching his vision for the new God of War the new formula and there was obviously a lot of doubt in the studio for this new vision and most people didn't want to change the old Greek formula uh but you were one of the few people who actually pushed him to go all the way uh, to, you know, to kind of start over with God of War. Um, what was your mentality? What was your mindset at the time to suggest such drastic change for the franchise? Um, it, it just really comes down to, I think, just development philosophy. Like if you're going to change, then you, you have to change. Mm -hmm. And that means nothing can be sacred. You know, it was tear everything down and just like kratos that's where you start you have kratos that's it no nothing attached to him just him as a person and then we started to talk about like well you know where do we want him to go what do we want to do with the character arc and then you know corey started talking about the son dynamic and the family um this kind of idea of found family as well that we would perpetuate through the the, the norse saga mm -hmm. so it was like from a gameplay point of view it was like well we we need to start over and, and like bring it you know into the times that were happening you know the, the old games were built on the foundation of you know, old japanese action games like ninja gaiden and double may cry and you know we we were huge fans of those games we, we all grew up playing fighting games and played in the office all the time during those games i mean i can't tell you how many times i've beat cory at marvel versus capcom 2 um but uh it's it was just a fun time and so you know games were changing they were becoming more modern the you know, the last of us was out uh, oh, yeah. souls games were there you know we were start, starting to take inspiration from a lot of different places and it was just time to reinvent him so i was always of this mind of like what if we could do an action game that has a really close camera like a almost like a documentarian like oh, yeah. style yeah. and that was probably the most contentious thing of, ever, of all the things um just because you know most action games the cameras pulled out you still people see people complain they want to pull the camera out and that's fine, but there there are games that do that. Just because, though, you know, we're not doing that doesn't mean that we should do that. Uh, we had our own style that we were going for. Just like our game didn't play exactly like Double Man Cry or Ninja Gaiden. You know, that's the whole point of having different games. They play different. <laughs> if it's not your cup of tea, there's something else that you can go play. Um, so that that was a big big part of it. And then you know the new weapon started to come in, the idea of the axe, and you know because I I was like, right, well we let's not do the blades because if we do, we'll just, just We'll just make the blades work in a new camera and that's not very that's not going to push the bounds and then when you're going to get close with a camera like that jumps aren't great and i was like well, if we're going to be more grounded you know like let's literally make him grounded yeah um and i know that's not a popular decision as well some people like that agency but we were just going for a different feel um mm -hmm. and it, it, you just take some risks and you know we weren't we were not very popular at the studio i'll say that in the early days uh people were like oh man they're gonna mess it up they're gonna break it but as you start to get a little bit extra wins, you get some more people, you know, on the team, like Jason McDonald really embraced the camera at one point where he he hated it so much he went and built his own camera. And then he ended up with a camera that was closer than the one we wanted. 
he figured out some things that were really interesting, you know, so it was like, it was counterintuitive, but then he even made it better. And that was almost pretty much the camera we shipped with. So you just have to get people to feel comfortable going into the unknown and trying things. Um, and that's, a, it's a very difficult thing to go into the unknown and, you know, people are like, people like comfort, uh, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, but so. it, it was such a tremendous success because of it. It's, it's, I think it's a detriment for the studio to be able to break it apart and build it up and it, it, for it to be probably, well, e even technically a bigger success than the old games while still being God of War. It is, uh, yeah. Corey kind of summed it up in a good way um, after, and maybe this is around right before 2016, the reveal at E3, mm -hmm. the kind of thing at the studio, he would use a lot this phrase, he would be like, if you know the rules, you can break the rules. Mm -hmm. And that started to make people feel more comfortable because he was, he, you know, people looked at us and they're like, well, they know they built those games. They've yeah. been here for a long time. There's people on the team that know this stuff. And then people started to be empowered by that. Like they felt like, oh, I'm an expert in God of War. That means I could take it apart and put it to back together even better. Mm -hmm. And so it started to empower people. So sometimes it's just that of how you motivate people. You know, you can't just tell them like, hey, go down that dark hallway. There's lots of monsters and I'm not going to give you a flashlight. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like nobody was going to sign up for that. Uh, but if you kind of empower them and give them, you know, a flashlight and maybe some weapons, then maybe they'll go down that dark hallway and slay monsters. So that's what we kind of learned we needed to do. And I, I took some of those ideas and, you know, small phrasings for Ragnarok to get people yeah. on board with some of the crazy ideas we were going to do for this game. Oh, yeah. um, speaking yeah. of Ragnarok and you being the director, uh, it is a long standing tradition in, for God of War to change directors. What was <laughs> your uh, passing the torch story uh, in a way? Did, when did Corey approach you and how did you feel about it? Yeah, I, I, I've told this so many times now, it's it's kind of getting bland, but I'll, I'll add a little extra to this one. Um, basically, he was like, I'm tired, man, I'm done. Yeah, I need a break. I trust you. Will you do this? And I said no for like six months. And then he kept pestering me. And then finally, I was like, all right, all right. I was looking for a new challenge. Um, so I think we made the agreement right at the end of 2017. So I already knew before oh, even okay. the, the that was done and i came back and started at the studio full time in january of 2018 and i think they made the announcement maybe i can't remember when that was exactly I done yeah, it was it was it was done yeah. in the, that first year or whatever but well i'm saying to the team we'll let the team know oh, oh okay um and so that was kind of an interesting thing but then we started to do these like off-site things after 2018 shipped where the leadership would get together and talk and all this kind of stuff and everybody was supposed to give like a little 101 breakdown of their job that they were giving to the next person. So Corey being Corey, you know, he just trolls you. Um, everybody was having these flowery sessions and you're going to be awesome and writing all these notes and all this kind of stuff. So he comes over to me with this piece of paper and at the top in quotes in lowercase print, it just said everything and he just handed it to me and it was blank. That was his like, here you go. This is what you're going to need to know. And, and he wasn't wrong, though. I mean, he was trolling me, but he was also being super honest at the same yeah. time. It's like he's like basically saying there's nothing I can tell you that's going to prepare you for what you're about to do. Mm -hmm. So just everything. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the same advice I would give anybody that's going to take on, you know, the job next, uh, because it, it is every single piece of the game, every person, every department, you know, um, it's just the fans alone, you know, you want it, you don't want to let them down. So they're in your head all the time. And, um, it is literally everything, but it's, that's the most rewarding part too, that you get to touch everything. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about one part of everything and making and developing a game like this. Um, and that's the fact that in modern AAA games, you, uh, have to be almost as good of a filmmaker director as you are a game director because you have access to the virtual set and to big name actors mm -hmm. and the cameraman. I don't know how much filmmaking experience you have, but coming from a game design, combat design uh, background, how did you find that uh, aspect of making this game? That's a great question. You're right. I come from a combat background. So my understanding of movies is more from like almost like a fight choreography standpoint. Like, I grew up watching, you know, Hong Kong movies, like uh, all the action movies of those days. So that just was, you know, like my breeding ground, if you will, for for what I wanted to do. Grew up in the arcades playing Street Fighter, like all the time, you know, like that. that's what I did. Um, so going into this, it, that was a little scary. Um, but I had worked with Corey and been 
you know, over the last 20 years. So you pick up a lot just secondhand, mm -hmm. you know, because he's so good at it. And then also, um, when at, right after we left the Santa Monica the first time, he was working with George Miller um, over in Australia on mm -hmm. Mad Max and a couple other things. And I went out for a couple of days. I think it was maybe 10 days or something like that. And I got like a crash course with George Miller and like how you make movies and stuff like that. It was incredible. Awesome. It was like one of the most amazing experiences, you know. But like I was only there for 10 days. Corey was there for like almost like a year or something like that or more. I can't even remember how long he was there. So, it, you know, again, it was just kind of like playing off that. Then when it got to actually working on Ragnarok with the team, uh, Matt Sofos, our narrative director, he'd been through all of, you know, 2018 with Corey on set and, and Rich Gobert, our lead writer. And then Dory, our DP cinematographer, like what cameraman, um, set up the scenes. Like, you know, I mean, I could give him a whole bunch of titles. That guy was awesome. Um, and he, we sat down early and I talked about things that I wanted to achieve with a, with a single shot camera, ways I wanted to push it. He got pretty excited oh, about yeah. some stuff. You know, we, yeah. there's some, you've probably already experienced some of the magic moments that happen with that. Um, so we didn't look at it as a limitation. We looked at it as like, we can do things that no one else can do in a really interesting way because of the way the camera's set up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So so Dory was awesome. And then the entire um, crew over at the the, the volume, um, Ryan Beeson and his his guys are so awesome at setting everything up. And then, you know, our animators, they do all the previs and, uh, early. Uh, and then we put those together as little uh, videos that we can show the actors. You know, and then you just do all the stuff. You just you go through what's tried and true. You do your table reads, you do your rehearsals, you get up there, you know, you do a couple takes, you adjust. So yeah, it was a new world, but it, we we did it more of like a community or committee of directing on the set than like, you know, your typical movie where you have the big director and he says action and cut and all that. Like Matt called action and cut on all the scenes because I wanted to focus on what was going on and um, even when we go to give feedback, we'd break it up. You know, Matt would get somebody, I would go talk to somebody else, Dory would talk to another person, depending on you know, Bruno, um, our animation director, he would go talk to people, Erica, our cinematics lead, she would go, it was just dependent on what the situation needed. Was it, was it, um, the line needed to be a little different? You needed to be here a little sooner, a little bit more emotion, or you know, your, the way you held the ax was wrong, or what, you know, we got to fix these little things. And just, it was this group effort. And the actors were totally bought into it. They loved it. And when we got there, uh, one of the, the things I've been telling people is that because of the one shot, you know, you get a take and then it's not really good. Mm -hmm. But right around four, five, six takes in, it starts to gel because everybody's like, because they're playing off each other. Nobody's leading the scene. It's like they all have to do their thing. The camera person has to do their thing. But when the scene is right, when we nail it, everybody knows. Oh, like I know the actors know everybody turns around at the same time like that was the one right it's this is kinetic feeling in in the air and I think that was one of my, the most rewarding things is being there and having those moments when people would turn around and be like that was it right so yeah so not very versed but crash courses and just studying behind the scenes and stealing from people <laughs> that I worked with and trusting the amazing people that we have on the team that's how we did it it's it's it, it's it turned out fantastic yeah i i don't i, <laughs> I can't speak about anything it, it, yeah it's i know a it's tough hard for me not to <laughs> uh, um one of the more interesting things uh, we were talking about breaking apart god of war and building it together as this new thing but there was uh i i noticed even even uh, in the promotion of this game that it it ties it ties a little more to the old Greek games uh, in the combat. It's been uh, obviously the focus on the blades uh, much more, and the brutality has been up a fair bit. Uh, Odin in the latest trailers kind of talking about, oh Kratos, you're just a monster, that sort of thing. There seems to be a very deliberate uh, callback to those older games. Uh, what 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 was your kind of process of getting? Uh, kind of call, calling back to those yeah um i mean part of it is just me you know i've worked on all the god of war games yeah. so there's i was like i'm gonna do little callbacks to things i thought were amazing in the old games um but it all comes from the storytelling standpoint you know mm -hmm. if you look at 2018 right at the beginning when he fights balder that's a hard fight for kratos you know at the end of that that fight kratos is on his back looking up breathing heavily and we know the rule right spartans never on their back so if somebody's got him like that he's not quite where he needed to be so we we always talked about that being him like he had a bit of ring rust if you don't know that term it's like a boxing term where you haven't fought in a while and you got to knock the ring rust off okay. and 
So that Kratos had to kind of get back into shape. But Ragnarok starts after they've been training for three years. Kratos has been building himself back up and building his son back up. So this Kratos is more in tune with the old guy he used to be. Yeah. But with all of the personal emotional go- growth of 2018 on top of that. So he's not just, he's like there mentally, he's there physically, he's there spiritually, you know, to take care of his son, teach him well. So you see a little bit of that starting to come back out. You know, he's, he's, he's moving a little quicker. He's, he's not just the guy who retired. Mm-hmm. And so that it was, it's not just because, oh, it's selfish from my point, you know, as a director, I can do what I want. It was like, no, we wanted to be part of the story, you know, that he's and and he's opening up. He's talking about these things again because he kind of understands that holding him in is what's hurting that that struggle to hold on. If you just let some stuff go, if you just talk about it, you know, it's almost like like in modern days now, it's like it's OK to talk about shit that went wrong in your life. Yeah. Not hold it in there where it eats you alive and it hurts the people around you because you're emotionally unavailable to them. So we wanted that to all be part of the storytelling. So like not just saying things but showing it feeling it through the gameplay that this is a transition he's changed he's growing it was awesome to witness to go through 2018 and see a Kratos and Atreus become this unit as father and son and then see that union develop in Ragnarok both as a fighting unit but also to be so much more trusting of each other and so much open to each other but also of course keep uh, a lot of <laughs> secrets from each other still and that's that's a fantastic point of conflict uh, where to bring those two characters next um and uh, one, I have one last question, and it's the most important question, of course. Um, Fimble Winter is very cold, uh, but Kratos isn't covering his head at all. He's not uh, wearing a hat, and he doesn't grow his hair out. Uh, why is that? And can Kratos grow out hair, period? Well, he can grow hair, just not on his head. I mean, obviously, he didn't have a beard in the old games, and he's got a big old beard now, right? <laughs> I mean, um, but if, specifically. we'll think, okay, so let's, let's, you want to, we'll go through the, the canon, right? So what, when's the, what is the youngest version of Kratos we've ever seen? Uh, I believe in God of War 1, there is an image of his birth. Uh, and then in another deleted scene, there is a scene where he's about, I want to say three or four, and he's running away with his mother. And then after that, it's him and Demos uh, being taken away where I want to See? say, is 12 or 13 and he's always right. bold so you know the history so like then you should know the answer to this question no the <laughs> thing is we see him being bold but is it because he shapes it or is he just born like that <laughs> it, is... it sounds it sounds like a good theory video to me for you to make uh i have gone <laughs> to some big lengths to find out and i wanted to hear from the source but i suppose that it will remain a mystery okay eric thanks <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah again thank you so much uh for all this effort thank you to congratulations to you to the team to santa monica studio to all the other studios that have been helping this is a massive game a massive project and i took some time to just stand and absorb how much work went into this into every single aspect of this game and it is it is so impressive and it is incredibly impressive that this got made at all but also that it's so damn good <laughs> and it is just it is uh I've, I've said it a million times but uh just thank you and it's it's just amazing hey i don't know what to say to that i mean like this is why we do it like hearing that is just it means everything to me, you know, but sh- sure we hope we sell a lot. I'm sure we were hoping we were going to get a 90 plus, but it's people like you, like that's, that's the best part of the job because everyone sitting at home on the couch tonight, is going to have that feeling. And I had that growing up and I, I, I always love video games. And it was when you would get a really good one and you could just melt away, you know, and, and just have a blast with it. Um, you know, one of my most fond memories is playing like Final Fantasy II on SNES at my grandmother's house and just staying up all night, just being enthralled in that world and airships and, you know, like all these kind of amazing things. And it, to be able to give that back to somebody like 30 years later <laughs> is, uh, it's very humbling. Thank you so much. Thank it's, you. It's, you Thank know, you. I'm glad you're having a good time. Thank you. Uh, well, almost here. well, have a good day and enjoy it.
You too. It's, right. we're, you're almost at launch. Congrats, congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll let the team know for sure.